Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation, and thank you guys for, for coming. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself so that you get a sense of what, um, where we come from and why I'm going to be saying the things that I'll be saying in, for the next half hour. Um, Kernel Analytics is a company that develops tailor-made algorithms that automate and optimize decision-making. So we uh, use data from our clients to um, develop uh, predictive models, and then we deploy algorithms that help them in their daily operations, basically adding more intelligence to current uh, business processes. Um, today, I'm going to be making a case that is, while all these developments individually um, in marketing, in supply chain, in pricing, in um, asset deployment, while all these things individually make sense and add lots of value, um, today I'm going to be making the case for the next step, which is that it allows coordination across departments, creating some additional synergies that cannot be uh, obtained otherwise. Um, so right now I did a spoiler of my entire presentation. So basically this is my claim for today. So artificial intelligence will allow extreme day-to-day -day coordination. So not high-level coordination in which the two, you know, the CMO and the CO talk to each other. No, no, no. I'm going to be arguing that artificial intelligence will allow to um, make tangible in daily individual operational tactical decisions um, so that these two things are coherent, yeah? So basically, coordination between departments in a complex and changing environment, in, and that this will be a significant uh, competitive advantage that can be sustained and built over time. Uh, so basically, I'm going to be spending the rest of the presentation describing at a high level this idea, and then providing concrete examples in different industries and different decisions to make, uh, to make the case, yeah? So what is a little bit the, the big picture of before and after? <clears throat> so before, in the good old days, um, departments were operating uh, pretty much very, with, you know, autonomously. Um, coordination took place at the executive committee, uh, but not so much uh, between departments on an operational level. And companies had information silos that basically was reflecting departmental management silos. Yeah? So each department would hire their own application to run their show. And as a result, all this would end up in different information systems. So hence making it even more difficult to get this um, operational uh, coordination. Yeah? So what I'm suggesting is that in when everything that I'm describing today happens, and believe me, there's a lot of room for improvement, um, we will be getting like highly coordinated operations between departments at a micro level, at an operational daily level. Um, so the executive committee still, of course, makes sense to align strategies, but then AI, the data science or the data engineering will make it happen um, on a low level, yeah? Of course, there will be a unique data lake, and that is something that, yes, it is more and more mature in, in all companies, but artificial intelligence as a low-level coordinator, this is not so mature as we can see it, but yes, we can see some examples that I will share today of a tide, a wave that is coming and that we'll be seeing unfold in the next, in the next years. All right, so basically the examples that I came up with, I, of course, you know, different companies have different departments that are, you know, leading, but the cases that I'll, that I'll be presenting today cover these areas, yeah? So uh, marketing, both above the line and below the line, so marketing slash CRM. Operations, mostly supply chain. Um, pricing, um, and then expansion is, you know, typically asset deployment, yeah? So network deployment, or it could be even um, point of sale deployment, yeah? And then, of course, strategy and finance uh, are interested in aligning all this, be it from a budget perspective or be it from a, you know, coherence in strategy perspective, yeah? So, uh, okay, so let's jump into it. Um, <coughs> let me start with example number one, <coughs> pardon me which is flexible and personalized promotions, yeah? So this will involve CRM, supply chain, and pricing. So let's start with 
individual applications, and then we see how the combination of those creates some extra value beyond the individual applications, yes? So um, imagine that you are a fashion retailer. So you, you know, the, the season ends, the clearance period starts, and you have certain stocks for, uh, for individual products, yeah? So it is inevitable, we all know, um, that there will be discounts in this period, yeah? And when you have higher stocks, typically this requires higher discounts and the other way around, yeah? And uh, yes, there is one, um, you know, individual application that is only pricing, which is answering a complex question, which is what is the itinerary of discounts that I should put in order to get rid of my stock with the best possible margin, yeah? But this would, as such, would not fall in the talk that I'm giving today. It would be a talk on itself, markdown optimization, yeah? Um, then CRM and loyalty programs allow us, so different story now, CRM and loyalty programs allow us to understand extremely the tastes and the sensitivities of each individual customer. We don't do things by chance. So we can look at what we buy, what we click, what we abandon in the basket. And based on this, we know that, you know, Pau likes, you know, boring blue suits and somebody else likes more shiny mm, clothes. Um, we know who uh, is price sensitive, we know who's not price sensitive, basically by observing their behavior, yeah? So we know they don't do these things by coincidence. Um, so basically, we know we have, and, and when we develop recomm recommendation engines, basically what we're doing is we're trying to, you know, personalize CRM customer touch points one-on-one. -on -one. And again, this is a, you know, an interesting project on its own um, that allows to get, you know, uplifts, significant uplifts in, uh, in CRM uh, management. Having said this, the idea that I would like to present today is when we mix the two, yeah? So basically the idea is, <clears throat> okay, I know that I'll be doing 30% discounts two weeks from now when the clearance period starts. Um, what if I did some below the line offers to some of my clients directly saying, why don't you avoid all the hustle of going to the um, clearance period? You know, here's my 20% discount on these individual products that you care for. If you go now, private sales, it's all yours. So basically I can, I can uh, you know, do a first pre-sales period, target it, one-on-one -on -one that um, helps me sell a bit better clothes that I know that in two weeks' time they will be at a 30% discount. And from a CRM perspective, the customer says, okay, you know, I'm not sure whether this will be available in the clearance period. I know that clearance periods is a hassle in any case, so I might be inclined to accept that offer simply because of the convenience, yeah? Um, and the uncertainty of getting the right product. So basically here, what we're doing is we're, doing, we're mixing um, personalized uh, interactions, so personalization and pricing, and we're, uh, again, defending the margin a little bit better with respect to just pure pricing um, in the sales period. Yeah? Okay, so this is um, example number one. Let me move to example number two. Um, <coughs> smart shopping list and uh, stop food waste. So here the idea is, so now we're moving to a food retailer or yeah, supermarket more in general, yeah? not only food. Uh, the idea is that extremely from, simply from a CRM perspective, um, when we have recurrent purchases and supermarkets is one of those cases that we know clients come you know, every week or every two weeks and they buy lots of things. So, uh, and lots of these things we buy recurrently because we need to eat and clean and so on. So um, here there's one idea, which is again individual, which is how do we develop a smart shopping list? So basically telling our clients, you should stop thinking about doing the shopping list, let me help you with that. But of course, that requires some intelligence on, on the supermarket side, meaning 
Um, if you, I bought you know, two bottles of shampoo last week, please do not speak about shampoo until, I don't know, two months from now. Because if you are careful enough to be looking at how often I buy these things, I, I will, um, how often I, I will be buying these things, you will see that I'm not going to need any of this for the next yeah, few weeks. Yeah? So, uh, okay, so this is something that can be done. And we can see what is the frequency. And, and this works for everything that is, you know, shampoos, toothpastes, and all the basics. Yeah? And then, of course, when we go to the supermarket, we also have some indulgences. And these indulgences probably don't need to follow this stable pattern. It's more like, again, recommender engine. Say, okay, if you like pesto sauce, you might also like this other Italian sauce or whatever. Yeah? So, okay, so this is for as much as for the smart shopping list, um, telling people to stop thinking about this, and then they don't make mistakes. Then also, um, given that we can track with loyalty cards or, with, uh, or online, we can also predict store attendance. So when people are going to be coming to our stores, um, and the idea is to do that, the idea is that we can um, infer when it would be a good time for somebody to come to our store because we have lots of interesting things for that person that day. Meaning, if I like strawberries and I like whatever, a certain kind of shampoo, and if those two items are on sale with a heavy discount that particular day, then it might be a good idea to say, Pau, why don't you come to the store today, you know, instead of tomorrow, you were going to come in any case, but today we have this. So it creates a clear call to action for that particular person to come that particular day. Um, <clears throat> and again, and the stop food waste thing is um, dynamic pricing for uh, perishable goods. So the idea is that I have all these apples. I know that they're going to be off in one or two days. So I need to you know, decrease my price or start putting some promotion or some discount on it. So this, again, it's something that is interesting on its own. It's dynamic pricing to uh, sell with the best possible margin the uh, the, 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 the products that you have. So you create yourself a reputation for avoiding food waste, but at the same time, you are, um, yeah, so you're, 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 you're maximizing your margin. So you're doing both things at the same time. And what I'm claiming here is that these two things are interesting, but you can also add an extra thing on top of it, which is mixing the two. So saying when it is a good time uh, for a certain customer to go to the store and get all these things, yeah? And the idea is that all these things can be refreshed you know, in real time once we know how sales are going. And finally, of course, the supply chain bit of it is you know, to ensure that there's uh, product availability in, in all the supermarkets and all the stores and all the products. All right, change topics. Now we move to network rollout. Yeah? So if, if you um, are running a um, gas distribution company or a telecom operator, you will be deploying or spending huge amounts of money deploying networks, yeah? deploying pipes or antennas or fiber optics and so on and so forth. And you'll be investing a lot in this. And this is key for customer acquisition because if these things are not in place, um, customer acquisitions is impossible. So basically, you would like to know when, where, with a lot of precision, you should be deploying these networks, hoping that you know, neighbors in those streets would sign up for the service that you're offering. So um, <coughs> the rollout of these physical networks are, is extremely costly and with long-term returns. So basically, what we would like to know in this case is, sorry, one extra thing, and yes, in Spain and in any, you know, um, developed country and even developing ones, we have very rich data about people, volume of people, type of people, buildings, um, roads, own networks, competitors' networks. This one is a little bit less detailed, but everything else is extremely precise. So we know exactly how many people are living where at a building level. So we can get extremely granular. And what we would like to do here, of course, is learning from the areas that we cover and moving to uh, or extrapolating this knowledge to other areas that are not covered with your current network. Um, but it allows you to forecast how many people are going to be signing up on year one, year two, year three, and so on. And this is the benefit. This is the, this is the revenues that you can expect 
from uh, making the investment. So once this is done, we can do you know, the net present value of these deployments at a, at a building level or at a street um, level. And then, of course, here comes the, um, the ex so CRM is in charge of acquisition of customers. Um, expansion is you know, in charge of making it happen, deploying the network. And then uh, the finance guys, of course, this has heavy CapEx implications. And, uh, and when we're talking about deploying uh, telecom networks, also OPEX implications. So, uh, so they try to make sure that everything is aligned, yeah? so that, the, that they get the best return on investment on these, on these, uh, on these things. Um, the, the, the gas distribution example is very easy to follow. Then if you translate it to uh, mobile telephony, it gets more tricky, but the logic is the same. So um, when you do a gas distribution, you need to have a, not only you need to identify what you know, streets, like parts of streets um, are profitable, you also need to link them together because the gas needs to flow through the, the network. Yeah? Um, so then it, the algorithm, the engine needs to be smart enough to know where it needs to go and, uh, and how to link all the profitable bits um, and in a non-myopic way. Yeah? So it needs to be able to make little investments to reach profitable areas. When you do this same idea for a telecom operator, um, the logic is the same. It's simply that antennas do not need to be you know, um, connected with pipes necessarily, but, but definitely you need to simulate adding this extra antenna in the network or upgrading the capacity or the technology from 3G to 4G of these antennas. What is the impact on the quality of service? What is the impact on the customer experience? What is the impact on business metrics of customers living in that area? And then is when you can close the circle and basically um, these two examples end up in some sort of like bottom-up simulator in which you can um, in which you can bring together on the same table the finance guys who will say how much is this going to cost from a capex perspective and what opex implications it might have, the CRM slash strategy guy who says well I have all these you know customers that are increasing their data consumption and I want to you know launch this new um, price plans with all these data uh, packages on it. Um, and then the expansion guy says, wait, 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 I need, you know, this is the dimensioning that I need for all this to happen. And then they, it basically allows to coordinate a coherent strategy between the three of these until they converge, yeah? All right, um, let's move on to um, another example. Um, <coughs> um, pricing and personal, so personalized pricing and bundling. So now we're going to the airline industry. Um, and here, um, one could say, okay, what prices should I have for my flights? But more in particular here, I'm gonna be talking about ancillaries. So ancillaries are all these services that you are offered after, the, um, after you buy the ticket, yeah? So the insurance, the, um, the preferred seating, the, uh, um, the uh, boarding and, and all these extra things, yeah, food sometimes. So in the past, uh, these were used to be the same for every route, yeah? So if you go from Barcelona to Madrid, then you know, these are the prices. Uh, but really, we have a lot of information when people are making that decision. We know what kind of reservation, and sometimes we also know what exact customer is behind that reservation. So we can fine tune these prices to uh, increase customer satisfaction and revenues and net, because these are typically services with a very low marginal cost, but high value for clients. Yeah? So basically, you know, adding an extra suitcase in the, in, in the plane or you know, um, offering uh, priority uh, insurance or the priority seat, uh, boarding, it doesn't really cost me much um, as, a, as an airline but uh, it, 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 it is something that people are willing to pay. The question is how much? And of course, if you do um, you know, targeted pricing, you can, you can, you can increase these. Uh, and basically, it's, a, it's an industry that is already used to different prices. We all know that when we're sitting inside a plane, we know that nobody in the plane paid the same price for that ticket and we're cool with it. We're simply extending the same logic to the ancillaries. So, um, so 
basically the idea here is um, how do we define these prices? And of course, this is a long story, but it, it, it has to do with uh, you know, estimating elasticity based on massive A-B testing. And, and once you have this, it, it, it is a system that continuously challenges current prices, targeted, segmented, dynamic prices, and until continuously it finds the more optimal ones. This, again, is a pricing uh, exercise only, um, but it has very interesting synergies with CRM, um, and both batch and in real time. So batch is, okay, this is the prices that I would you know, otherwise give to Paul Agulló uh, based on his past behavior. So we know that he you know, appreciates very much checking in the suitcase and not so much some, some, some other thing. So the idea is, okay, we screw up with Paul Agulló. We lost his luggage um, last time he flew with us. So we can use this also to give favorable conditions or even for free sometimes some of these things because it has long-term implications in terms of customer value management. And this is uh, where the CRM bit comes in. And of course, pricing and CRM, they need to be coordinated on this front so that we're not charging, assume that I'm a business traveler, assume that business travelers get high prices, assume that they lost my luggage and I get a high price for something else, then I get extremely upset. So um, the logic is that they, you know, that they can compensate and, and, and yeah, and they can, so that, so that from a CRM perspective, they take care of a you know, valuable customer like myself. Um, at the same time, it could be in real time. It's like, sorry, Mr. Agulo, we are late, and we're, you know, the flight is not going to take off for the next four hours. So this, again, is something that can be applied in real time. And again, it needs to be consistent, because if I try to you know, hire something else in, that, in real time, for whatever reason, then um, this is something that they can play around with. But it can, it, can be, it can be also applied to the hotel industry um, with the ancillary services that hotels offer to their guests beyond the room themselves. Yeah? So, uh, okay, so this is idea number four, I think. So let me move to promotion optimization. So um, <coughs> Um, single idea. Promotion measurement has greatly evolved in the last year, so now companies, consumer goods companies, know much better what is the profitability of their, um, of their promotion. So basically answering a very simple yet important and tricky question, which is when we did the 50% discount on the second unit, did we make money or did we lose money? And this has to do with you know, somehow reconstructing the counterfactual of what would have happened if I didn't do the promotion, and then try to see whether the sales uplift more than compensates the loss in margin, the cost of the promotions, and maybe some cross-product, cross-time cannibalization, yeah? So um, all this is good, and it, you know, it's more or less where the state of the art is. So this helps companies to understand past profitability, and it allows them to negotiate with retailers with better information so that they, they know what are the implications uh, of, their, of their promotions, future promotions for their profitability. Again, this is a single area, which is you know, trade marketing. Yeah? Um, but of course, um, there is another department that is marketing, like above the line mark marketing. So these are the guys that you know, make um, ads on TV. And these, uh, you know, they invest heavily, as a, a, again, and it, this also has an impact, sometimes, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, on sales. So it's good to not do double accounting and that, that trade marketing gets their own benefits and the marketing guys get their own benefits, yeah? Um, but then you also have below the line. So this is CRM people getting agreements with the retailers so that they can do coupon recommendation for their clients, yeah? So this is where the below the line thing comes in. So basically getting the net profitability and what is the best way to do ads on TV, trade marketing for everyone that comes to the supermarket or personalized targeted coupons to the, uh, to the, to the customers of the supermarket, how all that fits in and how is, uh, when are we being too generous and when we're being not enough generous. Uh, so what is, what, are, what is the combination of all these parameters to maximize overall efficiency. And of course, 
once you've done this, there are you know, upstream implications for supply chain to make sure that you have enough um, product in all, in all the stores. Yeah? Um, and also, of course, to optimize the uh, advertisement um, investment. Yeah? So again, here we're mixing marketing, trade marketing, supply chain, and CRM all in one same um, cocktail mixer. <coughs> Let me move to assortment. Um, so here the idea is, um, imagine the company here, um, what they're doing is, um, it's a flash sales company. So here the idea is that we have um, products um, available for a, for a limited amount of time. Yeah? So uh, Im imagine that you're selling um, clothing. So um, you know, relatively high-end brands with hard discount, but they are available only for five days. So you need to, so customers need to make a bit of an impulse decision, which is, should I buy this now that it's 50% off or not? And, um, and so basically what these companies do is like they put new campaigns, which are essentially brands, lots of products within those brands and a certain discount. And then, um, based on this, they, uh, yeah, they sell, basically, until they run out of the stock. Big brands try to use this online outlet, so to speak, to, uh, again, get rid of the stock from, from pre previous um, seasons. So um, this company um, has developed um, an engine that helps uh, personalize interactions with each individual customer. So basically, this... Uh, we know perfectly how much each customer bought, what they bought, what they clicked, what they uh, abandoned in the basket, um, as, you know, as far back as we want, so years. Yeah? So basically, we know everything that has interested you in the past. And this, of course, um, helps us making these uh, recommendations with a lot of precision. And when you check it with a control group or champion challenger, so the non-personalized um, group and the personalized group, you see an uplift, uh, a significant uplift that can be, you know, between 10 and 20 percent. Now, the question, so again, this is a single idea, it's pure CRM, it works nicely and it's, and it's, and it's fantastic, yeah? Um, now, the idea though is, so this is more answering a commercial question, an assortment question from this um, online outlet company. And the idea is what how should I, what calendar should I have for all the different campaigns to maximize overall sales? And of course here, the idea is that we might be losing sales for two reasons. Reason one is what we call it coverage. So basically there is a group of people, a, a group of users in your, in, your, in your customer base that finds nothing of interest that particular day. So this would be a mistake that the assortment people have done because uh, there are certain people that like, I don't know, sports, clothes. And that particular day, there's nothing for them. So this is something that we can anticipate because we know through the engine, we know exactly what is it that, they, that each customer cares about. So we could simulate you know, what would happen. And we can see things like, like this, that, that, some, that there's coverage issues. The other one is uh, the opposite meaning this is a bit of an impulse uh, market. Therefore, if there are two products or two brands that completely overlap, it could be that you indulge yourself with one purchase but not two in a given day. So following this reasoning, having the, I don't know, Adidas and Nike campaigns on the same day would be a bad idea because they, they would be cannibalizing each other's sales. So these are two things that uh, we could discuss, but we don't need to discuss because we have data to test these things. So the idea is to try to understand how overall sales relate to the um, coverage that you have. So whether each user finds at least one or a few campaigns relevant for that particular day. And secondly, whether there are campaigns that overlap each other and they cannibalize each other's sales. So this is something that we can go to the data and understand. And based on this, we can simulate what is the best calendar for all the campaigns and, and, and when they should be launched. Yeah? So here the idea is um, that it allows me to better plan 
assortment um, definition. Yeah. So uh, so how these things should be combined. And of course, this has CRM implications, but also operations implications, and um, and finance because we know when these things are coming in. All right. Um, Last example, availability planning. Um, okay, so imagine that you are, you know, the COO of um, Uber or Cabify or Glovo and all these transportation companies. Um, the tricky, what is core business for these companies is to make sure that the, um, supply equals demand for transportation in space and time. Yeah. So basically, that you have the adequate but not too much, but not too little, like not too few, drivers available, um, again, in space and time. So in the right areas at the right times of the day. If you have excessive drivers, you're creating frustrating in your own uh, fleet. And if, you're, and if you are short of drivers, then you're creating frustration on the customer side. So basically, your job is to balance these two things continuously. And then if you leave the markets, so to speak, to work on their own, these two things do not match magically. It would take too much work, too much friction, too much frustration, yeah? Until drivers learn when they should be available or when customers know that they can rely on this. Um, you, as a COO, um, know this better and, and, you, can, and you have some um, marketing levers that you can use to make these two things match all the time. What are these things? So. Um, well, these two things are incentives, really. Uh, so, uh, one thing would be uh, pricing, yeah? So, from a customer perspective, if you're asking for a ride when it is more difficult to get drivers then you know, uh, or there's scarcity, say, you know, 2 a.m. on a Friday night, then uh, I'll charge you more. So, this is what's called surge pricing. And it's you know beautifully done by Uber and, and these kind of companies and and then and and that's precisely the concept. Say okay, and of course there is an elasticity here at at, at play, which is how people react to changes in prices. But experience says that there is some flexibility, not infinite flexibility, but some flexibility in be willing to pay a bit more, basically because your alternatives are equally bad. Yeah, there are no taxes available, so I rely on Uber, even if it's you know two euros more expensive or three euros more expensive at that particular time and day. Um, okay, but then how do I make sure that I have enough drivers? And this is what extra benefits I can provide drivers to uh, be available when I need them. And this can be, again, surge pricing can benefit them as well. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you more. But I can also trade with promotion. So, so have some sort of a CRM aspect to it, which is I'll give you, I don't know, whatever, points. Or, and, and then I'll, I'll give you preference for the uh, booked rides, the one people going to the airports. These are good rides. They are booked in advance, so I can you know, assign them directly to individual drivers that you know, took the nuisance to be available on a Friday night when I needed him. So then I'm going to compensate the driver later on. So again, this is a CRM to drivers, dynamic pricing, um, all this together in making in operations, which is making sure that we have the right balance for between supply and demand. So uh, again, it can combine real-time pricing, but at the same time, there needs to be some, but the pricing can be real-time. The CRM needs to be happening a bit in advance, and that's why you need to make forecasts. Yeah, You need to know how many drivers you're going to need on a Friday night so that you can make the offer to the driver so that they can make plans and not have a, I don't know, dinner with their friends that particular day because they need to be available, Yeah, or a few of them. So again, we're mixing in Pricing, CRM, and operations on in one same layer, on one same engine that is you know, pure core business for, for these companies. So by now, I hope that I have convinced you that, um, that, this, that, that extreme coordination adds a lot of value in addition to the individual value that each of these applications uh, um, you know, cause. In, in, in individual departments. So I'm not saying that these individual um, advanced analytics applications don't make sense. Of course they do. But uh, what I'm saying is that th there is this extra uh, value to be realized, to be made, once you bring the two together. And uh, I, I came up with some examples of pricing, uh, network or uh, asset deployment, uh, marketing, CRM, and operations. And of course, 
All these things, um, and if you're familiar with this kind of uh, initiatives, you know that there is one part that is strictly analytical, which is, you know, again, artificial intelligence uh, predictive models, but then there is a business layer to it, that is, does this make sense? Are we creating value with this? And this is the strategy finance guys that make sure that we're investing in, you know, CRM for drivers is more than compensated with the revenues that we make for, for customers. Um, so, this is it for the talk. This is all I wanted to say. We have five minutes for questions, if anybody has a particular question. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, congratulations, Paul, for the presentation. Uh, I was late from other uh, sessions, so maybe you, you talk about that before to start. Okay. However, um, many um, companies who are deploying um, customer or package uh, CRM, ERP, and so on are talking right now about putting these models inside the CRM, inside the ERP. And one of the problems of this is to manage the life cycle of the models and the versions, the control, and so on. Like this. So um, to, to get extreme um, coordination, maybe the best should be to put inside the CRM, inside the ERP, inside the, 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 the kernel applications in the companies. Um, how, what do you uh, think about to put it inside or outside and coordinate and extract information from these systems to, to make uh, available the models and so on? Okay, typically, it's a, it's a very good question, and it's uh, far from being resolved, I think. I think different companies are doing different things. But our opinion is, um, you know, you, you need some flexibility to be maintaining and evolving these models. So models do not, you cannot forget about the models that you're running. You need to keep an eye on how they are performing all the time. Uh, so basically, we, what we suggest is, okay, you have here your data lake, then you have an, an, an environment in which analytics takes place. There is a, you know, the analytics toolbox and analytics sandbox. In the toolbox is where you have all the deployed models that are running. Um, our experience is that um, if you don't need real time, probably it's better that they sit in this you know, analytical toolbox, we call it, um, so that the, you, know, you have full flexibility to manage the algorithms, and then the results are plugged in the ERP or the operational systems, basically because, um, yeah, you don't want to slow down the, the, the you know, operations. Uh, but again, it depends on the flexibility that the ERP uh, offers in terms of having those models run inside. So typically, we favor being outside and then plugged in yeah, so typically there's an ERP, and um, this is a bit of an analytical bypass, and then it goes back in, and then it's all the... But, but again, um, there are you know, pros and cons. So. I had a, a question about uh, surge pricing. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like a, a very efficient um, idea in terms of s managing supply and demand. From a customer point of view, if there's a high variation in the amount of money that you pay, you could get negative emotional reactions sure. from the customers. I just wanted to know how big an issue this is and how companies are managing that. Okay, um, well, the, um, first of all, it's something that they know in advance before they book. So, so you're, you know, I would like to go from here to downtown Madrid. And then if I'm you know, making this request at the wrong time, um, 2 a.m., then they say, okay, it's more costly. But I, I can still make the call. So it's not, it's un, it's not unexpected ex post pricing that I get. It's upfront. So I can, I'm still in control of the decision. And uh, of course, there are limits to this. So, and I would say that it's um, within certain boundaries is something that is well accepted. Um, I think that it can be uh, you know, counterproductive if, if it goes out of these certain ranges or in certain occasions. Say that there is, I don't know, a fire, and then you know, your search price algorithm, if nobody is looking actively and knowing why is it that there is so much demand, you could say, oh, hey, great, great demand, you know, increase prices, and then you, you can get like, extremely negative reputation out of this. 
Um, but, uh, but of course, this is something that can be tested and that can be, uh, and, and so you, you know what are the limits of this. So if you have high prices, say, say that you go too far in that, you can see people you know, making a request and not booking. So, so you have all this information and you, um, so the short-term impact you can measure very accurately. The long-term implications, it's a bit more difficult to measure, yeah? So basically, if this uncertainty makes me not even ask for a quotation, then it is, uh, and again, this is something that can also be measured to see whether people go inactive when they have been exposed to extremely diverse prices. So the beauty of these like data natives companies is that you can pretty much model and measure all these things. Um, but so all this to say that it can be measured, it can be optimized from a business perspective, my impression is that within certain boundaries is something that is well accepted as it is for flying, as it is for hotels. Actually, I would argue that the variation in these services is a lot, in, in, in rides, is a lot lower than, than, than hotels and, air, and airplanes. Okay, I think we ran out of time. If anybody uh, has additional questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, you can find me at the, at the booth of Kernel Analytics. So thank you very much, you guys.